I speak to you in the name of the living God, blessed Trinity, and lover of your souls. Wordsmiths can shape the letters of the alphabet to fit a thought, like an armorer shapes a breastplate to fit the heart. A smith forges each word in the kiln of passion, exposing the fine poetry of its fabrication, redesigning what was overused and worn into a symbol of the human soul's bravura. Wordsmithing is an art form. The Apostle Paul was a wordsmith. His dance with Greek was like Russian ballet. He could harmonize movements never seen before, making up words as he tried to explain the unexplainable event, the death of death and the resurrection of Jesus. Because Paul was a wordsmith, it's startling to read of his weakness with words in today's reading from his letter to the Romans. We do not know how to pray as we ought, he confesses. This word pray in Greek indicates the use of persuasive words. What words could you or I say to change the mind of God to our way of thinking? If we gathered all the wordsmiths of the world to write one prayer that dripped the taste of honey onto the divine tongue, could we convert God? We don't know how to do this with words, Paul admits. And if I've learned any lesson in the school of social distancing, it's that so many of our words have an arc of five foot eleven. They fall flat on the ground before us from six feet away. Words aren't always enough to convey the emotions of the heart. So when we can't touch one another and we can't find the words to say how we feel, what can we do? Paul says that we can look to God's Spirit for help. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, he writes. Spirit, in Greek, remember, is the same word as breath. And when we don't know what to say, sometimes breathing is all that we can do. Paul tells us that a groan or a sigh is enough of a prayer for God to hear what is on your heart. What is it about this particular way of breathing, groaning, sighing, that allows the Spirit to shape the desires of our heart into a prayer that God can hear? Paul uses an adjective to describe the word sigh. Synagmos alaletos. Together, these two words mean a sigh suppressed by grief that has become too deep for words. Not long ago, NPR ran a with the headline, An Anthropologist Discovers a New Emotion Locked in a single word. The story itself dates back to the 60s when anthropologists Renato and Shelley Rizaldo went to live among the Alangat people. This is an isolated tribe in the rainforest of the Philippines known for their headhunting. The couple studied the tribe and learned their language, but there was always one word that eluded translation. Ligot. The best explanation for the word that the Alangat came up with was that it's the feeling that led to their tribal tradition of headhunting. It's the feeling of wanting to take a human head and throw it. That's how one tribesman described it to a nodding crowd. The anthropologist tried to comprehend this emotional state and described it in English as feeling uncontrolled and unmoored but they knew they had never felt an emotion quite like this one, so they could not find a suitable translation in English. For 14 years, 
They lived among the tribe, and during that time, one of their beloved chiefs died. When Renato played a recording of the voice of that chief for some of the tribesmen, these warrior men began to cry out the word Ligus. But when they did so, Renato felt no fear. They weren't drawing swords or spears. No one tried to take his head. Instead, in the word, he felt the deep anguish of their grief at the loss of their chief. What could this word mean? He wondered. It seemed associated with death, but mingled with the electrical energy of both love and hate. There was no clarity in Ligat for Renato until the day his wife Shelley went on a hike to a nearby village without him and in a terrible accident fell off a 65-foot cliff to her death. As Renato crouched next to his wife's body, he said he could feel the seed of the alien emotion being planted inside of him. Weeks later, he returned to America, and after the funeral, he was resettling into daily life. But as the appearance of normalcy crept into his days, this strange feeling continued to grow. He could not express it. He could not define it. And then one afternoon, as he was driving down a sunny street in Palo Alto, California, he could not bear it any longer. He pulled his car to the side of the road, and out of his mouth came a roaring howl. And he knew it was like it. It was a high voltage groan for the hatred of death, for the, the love of his wife, a cry of grief for his loss. It was stenagmos alaletos, a sigh suppressed by grief that had become too deep for words. When our emotions have been suppressed by grief and finally find their expression, that is the prayer of the Holy Spirit. In this text from Romans, we glimpse God's commitment to breathing with us through the Spirit, to grieving with us in the deepest places of our soul. And that commitment comes with a promise. Nothing can separate us from love, not even this grief. And I think that this is a commitment and promise we need to hear from God because the pain of grief is one of the most frightening emotions we face as human beings. So much so that we have a history in our own culture of pushing death and grief out of our everyday lives as much as possible. At the turn of the 20th century, Americans called the main room in our homes the parlor. And through World War I, that's where funerals took place. We grieve in our homes. But after the war, when the flu virus killed millions more of our loved ones, we began to outsource the dying to care homes and the dead to funeral homes. We distanced ourselves from our own grief, and it began to show up in our colloquial language. We stopped calling that room the parlor. We gave that word to the funeral homes. We now call that room the living room. A hundred years ago, we removed grief from our homes. And as this new virus sweeps Ohio, we have all returned to our homes for safety but it is a place where we have forgotten how to grieve. As individuals, as a church, as a nation, a world, we are all in this collective COVID-suppressed sigh of grief. And when Paul writes, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, I think this is the weakness he's speaking of. Not our weakness with words, but our weakness 
with grieving. When we lose the words to express our grief, God's Spirit will receive our sigh, our groan, as the prayer of the depths of our heart. God hears the sigh of the brother unable to sit with his sister in a quarantine hospital room, the sigh of the father powerless to work, of the child who's missing his friends in school, of the elderly woman alone in her assisted living apartment, of the mother trying to figure out how to work from home with a full house and poor internet. Whatever your sigh may be, whether it seems to you to be as inane as faulty inter- internet or as serious as death, God will hear your grief's prayer. You don't need to be a wordsmith for God to hear your prayer. Your sigh of grief is the taste of honey on the divine tongue, by which the Spirit is continually persuading God to take everything we think separates us from one another, separates us from love. God takes that prayer and works it all together for the good of those who love God. 